clients lie. Now, if that sounds a little bit too strong or it sounds insidious, I don't believe there's malicious intent. So we could reframe that to clients at the very least misreport. They underestimate the size of their portions. They conveniently forget some of the things that they ate, which they claim they didn't. And if Carol brought the cookies into the office, do those calories really count? Yes, Steve, they actually do. But we all know that clients misreport. But why are they doing it? What's the intention? What's the motivation? And how do we, if not eliminate it, minimize it? James Petraska is one of the co-developers of the trans-theoretical model of change. Now, he studied well, he and his team studied 125 smoking cessation programs. And he concedes that in a lot of cases, misreporting is as high as 30 to 40%. That means out of 10 people you meet with, 40% will lie to you about the things that they're reporting. Where in smoking cessation programs, very often, the rate of misreporting was as low as 2%. Wow, that's significant. What's the difference there? And the difference was within the space that the therapist or the coach held for the client. Here's what I mean. In instances where the coach demanded certain things from the client, or they had this attachment to you must engage in specific behaviors, and you either do engage in these behaviors or you don't. There's nowhere in between. Besides the fact that when it comes to behavior change, that's wrong, that elicited a much higher rate of misreporting where when someone had a high level of expectation, but as a space they held for and a belief they had in the client, but not a demand that they were placing upon them, that client felt so much more safe and they, there was much greater openness and they were able to, within those instances, take the misreporting rate for about 30 to 40 percent and bring it down to two. So here's how that shows up. If we insist that our clients meet our demands and our expectations rather than acting on their own decisions, core values and volition, we're provoking them to misreport and engage in something other than openness, which destroys the relationship and impedes their level of results and frustrates the both of us. There are certain sub behaviors that are indicators of readiness. So you didn't just go to the gym. You might think that when you started exercising, when you started doing anything, you just went ahead and took action, but that's not what we did. We read up on it. We started imagining things. We engaged in visualization. We talked to people who are already doing the thing that we wanted to do. So there are a lot of sub steps that were preparing us to engage in definitive behaviors. And we have to have that space where that's okay. Even if let's say we're dealing with someone with smoking cessation and they're pushing back because all anybody wants to talk about is their smoking habits. And we say something like, so Jane, I'm getting the sense that when people talk to you, they insist that you address your smoking, but you're not ready right now. And you feel judged and you feel put off by this. And this is not what you want to focus on today. Okay, Jane, well, what would you like to focus? What would be the best use of our time? The irony there is that approach is more likely to support Jane and her smoking cessation than taking a definitive, no-nonsense, demanding black or white approach to, Jane, we're either going to engage in the behaviors that lead you to decrease and eliminate smoking, or we're not today. That elicits misreporting. It doesn't elicit adherence. So the next time, our clients are misreporting rather than saying, oh, why are our clients lying? Why don't they do the work? What we could say is, what are we doing? What's the space we're holding? What's the position we're taking that's producing this response in our client? 